welcome to Insight of New England's Therapeutic Talk. Please like, subscribe, and comment below. Hello, we are going to have a very special guest today. She is a beautiful woman. She is going to talk with us about some of the work that she has done. Uh, she's going to talk with us about a book that she wrote. She is an author. It is actually a very controversial book in some countries. Uh, she is also going to talk with us about being the only woman um, on the board, the Islamic a member of the Executive Board of Islamic Association of Central Connecticut. She is also on the Board of Directors for the YWCA. She also works with the Women Initiative. Um, she is a speaker and she is an advocate for social justice. And I'm really excited to have her here. She's also going to talk about a little bit about women in Islam. Hey everybody, I'm Candace, and you're watching Insight of New England. And today I have a very special guest. Um, would you like to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. I hope everybody's doing well. Thank you for inviting me, Candace. I've been very excited to be on your uh, show. Um, my name is Maha Abdullah, and I am uh, a program manager. I am an author, a multilingual educator, and a public speaker. I have uh, such a great passion for fighting for social justice, and I do a lot of community work um, in addition to my full-time job. I'm a mom of three, and um, I love um, helping people and uh, working on connecting the needs with the resources. This is one of my skills, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> and so you're, you're an author, so do you want to talk a little bit about that? Yes. So I've written, I've edited many books. I've translated many books. I've edited, uh, I've actually also wrote um, uh, like a corner, a weekly corner for the talented and gifted child. But I published my own book in 2010. It is uh, called Ten Manners to the Believer, a mirroring effect um, of a, a, a satanic journey. And I drew the title uh, mirroring uh, the book that I wrote about. So my book is actually a literary criticism of Ten Manners to the Satanic Verses. Uh, as uh, some of you know, uh, or might know, that this book has uh, raised a very big issue to when it was published in 1989 and um, it was um, given the accusation of the attacking Islam and it, it really made a big um, commotion and uh, my when I was doing my master's in English language and literature uh, my perspective was very unique in a way that I was invited to write it and publish it because it's not out there so with all of the hundreds of thousands of articles and with all the books written about his book my unique perspective was different, and I published it into a, a book, and um, I talked about it. I don't want to, you know, ruin it for the people who want to read it, but I, uh, I talked about her personal intake and his personal journey uh, through the book, and I made it into reflections, like, you know, what is happening there, using the literature, um, literature, um, you know, characterizations and moments and what he does, and... Um, the effect of what he did. So, wow. <laughs> and I, I actually have the book is banned in the Arabic or Muslim countries, and it's still banned until today. I was in the process of translating it into Arabic and wanted to publish my book, at least you know, to for people to know a different perspective of the book. Uh, but I am um, not able yet because of the situation in the Middle East, and uh, hopefully we'll come accomplish this soon. Maybe one day, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> but people can purchase it on Amazon and stuff here? So. Yeah, it could be on Amazon. It's in Barnes and Nobles also. Um, I can send you also, Candice, the name of the book too. Yeah. yeah. So we'll show, we'll show pictures of it too. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> and your community work that you do um, in New Britain, actually, yeah. right? You do a lot of work. Mm -hmm. um, so what what have yeah. you been doing? <laughs> 
Well, um, to be honest, I, I never lived in New Britain, but all of my work, <laughs> full-time job and uh, community work mostly is based in New Britain. I was uh, uh, trying to help the community in all of the capacities that I can and that I have. So I've been um, doing many things. One of it, one of these things is that creating programs. So um, as far as like 13 or 14 years ago, I started to creating to create programs for the community. So I created this uh, once a week program uh, for the youth and I was invited to, I was asked actually to teach uh, the women, uh, the Muslim and Arabic speaking um, ladies in the New Britain area. But um, instead I had a better idea saying, listen, the youth who are are going outside um, of their community bubble they are they need help in representing themselves in the right way uh, in the community like in the high school or in college or in the outside community and so I prefer to work on that and I uh, created this program that was every Sunday and it was like a holistic program where we teach them um, you know how to present themselves. I used to pick articles from the newspapers and we discuss them. And because uh, I felt, uh, to be honest, like there is a distorted image out there for, about Muslims, and we need to correct it. And we need to correct it by our actions and to be represented by uh, the young uh, adults uh, out there to be more effective. You know, and, um, and also at the same time to help them. Um, you know feel good about themselves and also role models for the generation after them. So this was how I started with working with the community. And then as a full-time teacher in the district, I also helped tweak a lot of programming there. And so for example, I'm gonna tell you the CWB program, which is called Communities Without Borders. And it's targeting uh, the help uh, to our immigrant community, so Spanish speaking or Arabic speaking. Uh, and I uh, helped the director of the program uh, like, uh, um, manage like what are the needs and how we can fulfill them and um, I created this uh, work uh, shop series that you know came or stems from the needs like you know they need uh, some uh, workshops about how to get their driver license how to study for the citizenship test how mm -hmm. to communicate with other communities within the, the city they live in, uh, things like that. And also tailored the ESL program towards their um, needs. Uh, so we did this uh, adult um, you know, uh, ESL classes. At the same time, we did field trips. We took them and took also the students and the schools uh, to field trips to show them uh, you know, ways to, uh, to acclimate to, their, to living in the United States. So we took them to New York, to Boston, to Surbridge Village to see all of these aspects and get them introduced to how life was in the United States and how they can be better um, citizens, you know, to be able to be active in the community. Um, you know, and also we had a small portion of this program about um, uh, keeping and reserving the heritage language. So we had Spanish and Arabic language program for the middle school students because we knew that parents are very uh, aware that these kids are going to lose their, or about to lose their language, uh, their heritage language, and so we wanted to preserve it. And so we're, therefore we created these classes for them to keep the heritage language. So I was all part of that. Part of that and because it was such a successful program we were able to gain that grant again I also worked with the uh, new director of the program and uh, it was happening until COVID happened that's right. so, <laughs> that's, <Yeah. laughs> I know. that's I really know. important that they're keeping their heritage language and learning more of that because yes. that makes them um, like that's gonna make them better better for like yeah. when you're on the job course and everything like that to have both is yeah. yes definitely so I also had a because of all of that Yes, because of all of that, I had a proposal idea for the uh, local university, which is CCSU, and I have spoken to them, but they're not yet ready yet for this idea. Hopefully, we'll follow up with it. But um, 
you know, also to speaking of uh, heritage language, and I, I value what you said, Candice, uh, I worked with the Islamic Center also on strengthening their um, programming, their Sunday school programming at the masjid itself or at the Islamic Center. And so I worked with teachers there. I trained them on how best to approach, um, you know, this issue and how to better dealing with the students who are living in the, in the United States, so which is a Western um, you know, background of cultural um, competency and who are coming from, or at least their parents are coming from the Middle East, which is a totally different mentality right. and traditional approach. And so we work with this, um, you know, all the time, constantly. And this is why I was advised also to be, I was invited to be on the executive board of the Islamic Center. I'm the only woman there. And uh, so I, I'm in there to, not only to help out and uh, better their programming, but also to make their voices heard and to initiate social change. I know you're, big, you're, a, big, you're a big advocate for that too. I am. <laughs> sounds yeah. like <laughs> yeah. It sounds like like you're not you're you're willing to take chances too, like with your book <laughs> and yeah. Yeah, you know so. and, <laughs> and everything. I mean, yeah. sometimes people don't want to hear another version of something, but it's important to hear it. <laughs> Yeah. Yes, I, 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 I'm so glad you said that. Somebody told me uh, we know that the book. <laughs> somebody told me we know that the book reached your book reached Salma Rusty himself when somebody comes knocking the door and you say you want it. <laughs> yeah. It's a daring. It's a daring step. I I know, but. Um, to be honest, I should really follow up and promote my book um, more. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because people are interested. <laughs> yeah. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Before we move out of the, the Islamic um, Center here, I wanted to tell you that we worked in a lot of events like open houses because I believe in um, not amalgamation. I believe in like, you know, putting people together, communities together to, I feel like it's much more productive. They work better together and once they know each other and also it, it comes with the benefits and positive impact uh, from when they work together and when they end understand each other so one of the events that I wanted to tell you about we had a we had a taste of Ramadan every year and you know as you know Ramadan is uh, our month of fasting and we we one of the things we work on is gener generosity and we give food you know uh, one of the most important thing about our culture, our Arabic background uh, and Muslim culture is that we like to feed people. This is one way of welcoming. And so we, we, we host this big event called Taste of Ramadan and I was in charge of it. They put me in charge of it and I said, are you sure? Because I'm going to make it as big as it can get. And they told me, go ahead. So <laughs> I changed a lot of its programming. One of, its, one of the ideas was for, to put the ladies who make the food, who actually make the food in charge of their food. You know, and um, we, we had created tables from different countries. We even had a Hispanic Muslim uh, table oh, nice. uh, at that event. <laughs> We we invited, so I want to tell you, usually we get like around two, three hundred people for that year, which was two years ago. We couldn't do it last year because, you know, COVID. But right the, the year before, we had almost a thousand people from uh, probably 20 different um, populations. You know, we had many, many people come in for that taste of Ramadan and we kept, uh, we had it open in the, in the streets, we decorated the streets, we, we closed the streets and uh, we, we just added tables. I remember picturing that event is like we just added tables and tables and food and food and we had extra food actually after that. We had the mayor elect come in, we had the board of education, we had many, many people um, come to that event. It was very successful and I was speaking to everybody. Everybody was enjoying their time. You know, these are some of the events that I feel like they are productive of um, community work. Yep. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, it lets people know each other. 
Yes, yes. And a lot of people didn't know there was this barrier. Um, and uh, I'm always uh, advocating for breaking barriers, uh, clarifying misconceptions, and breaking stereotypes. And this is what I have on my website. As you know, I'm a, spe uh, a speaker too. I do a lot of cultural competency trainings to agencies, nonprofits, uh, even educational institutes or communities. And um, you know, my goal is to really clarify misconceptions make people even closer to each other and understand that we have more in commonality than differences or even use the differences to enrich the relationships right there right yeah like embrace yeah. the differences too yeah yeah <laughs> yeah I'm gonna put it on my website. embrace <laughs> yeah <laughs> i like that no, i like that if you allow me to <laughs> My website, is called, uh, my website is called Finding the Missing Link. I'll also send it to you, but it's okay. my in my mahabdala.com. Yeah. yeah, I can attach all those like in the description. Yes. So people can like link into it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so okay. how is it being the only woman on the board? Oh, it feels... <laughs> Uh, it's it's really good. I mean, I expected it. Like I, you know, I thought like you know, um, it's unique. And um, uh, for especially this community here, they haven't had a lady on the board. And I feel like it's very important. I was so happy when I heard about it, and I didn't question it. I said, of course, I will. I will join. And I felt uh, you know, it's uh, giving the voice of women to that board, but at the same time presenting all of the ladies there and working advocating for their you know to be for their lives to be better uh how we can create programming how we can present them better you know or represent them better i uh, you know in that terms i um, i worked with the ywca i was also by invitation uh in, you know and, and on their board of directors so i uh, we created this um, a couple of initiatives, a couple of pro small programs for these ladies, and we accommodated their needs and their um, cultural background to make sure the program worked with them uh, or for them. And also, it increased um, uh, attendance of uh, such programming for the YWCA. And uh, we, I also helped them hire some personnel who's coming from that background, especially ladies. Mm -hmm. um, do you want to talk about women in Islam? I know like it could be like a whole, <laughs> it, yeah. could take, it could take hours, but yes. So uh, what makes me, uh, uh, to be honest, I feel a duty as a Muslim educated woman uh, who lived in the Western, uh, in the Western hemisphere, but came from the Eastern hemisphere. So I was born and raised in Syria and came here to the United States when I was 20 years old. Uh, so uh, I feel a duty on me to uh, represent Muslim women because the image for Muslim women it's very um, distorted out there. They think that Muslim women are oppressed. They have no education. Um, they don't even speak a language or a foreign language. Uh, they only their their um, um, you know perspective is only within their household in the kitchen. And this is something I don't like to hear at all. And I wanted to all I all, I've worked all my life to um, kind of um, uh, correct it somehow in some way. Um, and I wanted to, uh, I always uh, wanted to draw the attention to that there is a big difference between religion and cultural adaptation of religion. So meaning that religion does not say what exactly people see or perceive or act, you know, especially for Muslim women or Muslim community or somebody who's coming from the Middle East. And um, religion does not say how, you know, does not portray the same image that they're portraying. Um, but um, there is, this is why I do the cultural competency. I always try to show people where these people 
people coming from. And um, many times I'm consulted by you know school personnel, by nonprofit, by agencies who work with people who came to the United States. Of my ex uh, you know consulted for my expertise, like is this really religion? Can I go? Uh, you know how far can I go in discussing or denying or you know going through uh, making a decision? Um, how is it like is it um, really religion or is it just culture and i can discuss it you know you know and i've been into many many things and i think this is most beneficial for people or agencies who work with with muslims and who uh, you know, like on a daily basis, or they deal with uh, applications or programming. And I try to clarify, no, uh, this is not true. I'll give you a quick example. So we have students uh, coming from the Middle East whose parents don't want them in um, health classes or music classes, right? Mm -hmm. And there is nothing that's strictly in religion or in Islam that says it's prohibited. And I try to work with uh, the uh, school personnel at the at the same time work with the parents say listen this is not um, this is part of uh, basic education of your child but at the same time religion and God which we you know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala we say Allah God in Islam and say Allah never said that this is prohibited you know what I mean so I try to manage you know that the tension there and then we come up with a solution and um, with all of the things that I worked uh, uh, you know, through, uh, we have reached to a very good decision based on this, based on my important point, a difference between religion and cultural adaptation of it. I've trained uh, more than 45 agencies who work with refugees and recently settled immigrants um, in the United States who come from this background. So um, I still get, uh, you know, do that uh, even in times of COVID and uh, we do it virtually nowadays. Yeah. But I get, I get this consultancy um, questions all the time. Okay. Yeah. That's good that they have someone to help out with that. Because, yeah, I think it's important to separate the culture from the, the religion, especially with Islam, because it gets... Yeah, um, it's very complicated. <laughs> uh, back to the women in Islam. I wanted to tell you in one of my trainings to um, to teachers and school staff a couple of years ago, I mentioned some some not all some of the rights of women in Islam, and they were like they got out of the meeting or the workshops like wow I didn't know that. For example, like a woman is not uh, um, obligated to work, or even if she worked, she's not obligated to use. The the money to pay mortgage or bills or another thing um, unless she chooses to you know what I mean a man in Islam is or the husband uh, is supposed to take care of a lady uh, or his woman uh, in terms of shelter which is like um, you know it could be an apartment it could be a villa right <laughs> it depends on their financial situation but also for food so uh, food so he's responsible for feeding her and making sure her health is okay and also not only food and shelter but also being safe and being at peace so that's uh, that's one of the points that a lot of people need to also mention that uh, women are highly uh, Muslim women are highly educated uh, and uh, like as we all know women in general are multitasking right uh, so one of the things that I always like to mention when speaking about Muslim women is that um, uh, helping the nation you know the Muslim nation to be uh, to grow and uh, prosper uh, but also Aisha um, which is the who is the prophet's wife was the most uh, um, honorable to um, to memorize and deliver his sayings so we really anything that comes from her as a resource about the sayings of the prophet uh, she's very um, like trustworthy in, in these terms um, I mean like I said that uh, we can talk uh, we, we can have a special episode about women in Islam or yeah Islam. maybe we should <laughs> about Islam you know for you know in, in, in general but uh, 
um, you know, yeah, I'll be happy. Oh, speaking of that, and uh, you know, like I told you, like it's, I feel like it's, uh, it's, I take it upon myself as a duty to uh, represent Muslim women the right way. I was invited as a delegate to the United Nations three times already. I mean, if we didn't have COVID, it could have been four or five. Right. But <laughs> with COVID measures. <laughs> so when we say COVID measures, right, you got to multiply sometimes that the number we talk about or something like this. Um, your, your laugh is contagious, Candice. Yeah. I, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> so I was invited to the uh, United Nations as a delegate and uh, one of the, one of the, uh, conferences um, that of, of course you know have like 110 countries from all over the world was uh, how to connect high in, in high educational institutes like colleges um, uh, for uh, social uh, sorry for justice um, you know issues racial and justice issues uh, and I presented my program, Jiran, and I will talk about it in a minute. But um, the other two conferences that I attended at the United Nations was uh, where the UN Women, CSW 63rd and 64th. And um, these, uh, you know, they speak about all empowering women, all about that, uh, you know, of course, um, uh, creating programming and initiatives uh, tailored towards, um, you know, helping women and advocating for women and I was uh, there well, what's so unique about it uh, and I talk about this in my cultural competency or I if I am a, a keynote speaker I always talk about these moments when you are in the United Nations with uh, people like high in command you know they have decision-making seats what we say mm -hmm. and you see them hear things or ideas or suggestions and they um, decide right there on the spot. This is, good be, this is going to be a good program and we're going to take it. And you see a country, a whole country starting to take, uh, uh, to apply it. And this is so cool. This is what's so cool about the United Nations uh, conferences. And I was supporting there my friend uh, who, um, who is the CEO of uh, Global Funds for Women, for widow women, and uh, she helps widows around the, the world. She started in, in Africa and in Egypt, but now she's going throughout uh, you know, the world. And I'm hoping, I have an idea for her and I hope it works. I'm working on it. Uh, my goal is to take her project to the ladies or the widows in Syria, because after the war, as you know, uh, many women became widows and we're trying to help them out. So this is the project in progress I'm working on. We just need one more thing Thing to work uh, to to do so oh that's nice <laughs> yeah the one with that big like after covid yeah i mean we it can work with covid too it just needs uh because covid makes it slower and uh, you know i i believe myself you know uh that with all the positive uh, things and positive sides about COVID, but still I feel like, you know, the motion is slow, so it takes more time. When you are in person, you can just talk and, do, you know, make an understanding go across so you can make things happen. But when you're, you know, talking on the phone or doing emails and virtuals, it's, it, it takes away, I think, from the action. Um, oh. I just remember that I did a speech at, at the beginning of COVID times. I uh, I recorded this uh, positive message about COVID. I can send you the link also. Yeah, Canada. I think yeah. I saw that. Well, you saw that. I think so, yeah. Mm -hmm. But that actually, I mean, maybe I can attach that to this. Okay. So. Yeah. Because yeah. Mm -hmm. so, I'm still dealing with it. For now, yeah. Anyway. <laughs> so. yeah. Yes, we can. I mean, I tend to have a very positive outlook at the world, even in the darkest moments. And I thought like people were struggling, and I felt like uh, as a as a speaker, I should really put this out there, and also to help people, you know, see or hear a different perspective. Right. Yeah. So, uh, going back to filling or connecting the need with the resources, working with this community here, um, and not only in New Britain, but you know, in Connecticut for in general, and sometimes other states. Um, so that the, the refugees and the recently settled 
families in the United States suffer from a lot of challenges here. And um, different from the idea that people think or see uh, is that um, you they take so much time. So let's say uh, a family is brought by a um, resettling agency, right, as a refugee family. They were they are expected by American standards uh, to be um, financially, uh, mentally, uh, socially uh, independent within six or eight to twelve months. Okay, and this definitely definitely proved not to be the case. Uh, many challenges persist to 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 be there for years to come, and it takes so much uh, to uh, you know to be financially or uh, you know socially independent in the United States, taking into consideration that you need support, emotional support, social support, you know, people from coming from the ba same background. And I was really intrigued by this idea to show people that it takes much more than this and that the, these programs are lacking. There is a big gap between what um, these people um, get um, you know, as, uh, as help when they come and uh, people, what the, they actually need, okay? I co-founded and co-created this program uh, with another friend of mine. Uh, this program is called Jiran, which means neighbors, and uh, it is a twofold. So we connect, uh, uh, we started as an initiative with Middlebury College, and we connect uh, Arabic language uh, college students who already know Arabic and already want, went to a different like country to enhance their uh, lang Arabic language proficiency. But with these um, circumstances now with the war, with everything that's happening, instead of going back to another Arabic country, I thought, um, you know, we thought that we connect them with the Arabic speaking population here, our community, where they can enhance their proficiency in Arabic, at the same time help these families and learn more about the challenges that they, they go through, specifically refugee and immigrant uh, families resettled in the United States and so uh, they come together for a mutual uh, linguistic and uh, cultural uh, exchange and they can teach each other help each other work together and we ask the students to um, I match the students with families here specifically in New Britain and uh, um, they, uh, the students uh, develop an action plan per family and they work with all members to you know, fulfill the needs. And we connect them with the resources. We also conduct, uh, I taught uh, uh, these students the highest levels of Arabic, which is non-formal. And so they learn and they, about the cause and they raise awareness. And so they hold also workshops to help these families. And the families also hold workshops to talk about their culture and whatever they want they're proud of and they you know share with this with the students and um, it's been very successful this is the third year last year we passed it for COVID because you know part of it is the students come to New Britain we um, rent a, a house for them and they would live and they would go to the host family every day and uh, you know, we also bring um, uh, keynote speakers to talk about the issue and how to help them we do also a couple of field trips for the students to learn about this and also for families to help them acclimate with the uh, environment around them and meet people from different um, communities. So it's like um, a very good program but this year because of you know the physical need to have the students here it's been very uh, hard but we keep I wanted to tell you I want to make sure that uh, I mentioned we keep support of the families and also communicating with the students. Every year we have a new cohort and uh, this year uh, we are in the process right now of uh, thinking how we're going to modify the program if COVID times keep um, you know maintaining the same situation right. until the, yes. yeah that's Hopefully. Right. yeah <laughs> But uh, because of this also, uh, and my, my work with the refugees, I was invited to be on the executive board of SAWA. SAWA is another nonprofit organization that works with refugees and immigrants uh, in the greater Hartford area. And this is how I also maintained my help and connection with the families by bringing other resources. Right now, we're working with SAWA 
on uh, having tutoring, ESL tutoring and you know, tutoring for kids, um, helping families, and also with COVID times to give them uh, emergency funds. Right, um, yeah. Things yeah. from that, you know. So this is, again, tailored back to your uh, goal of community, helping community work. Yes. <laughs> Helping communities. <laughs> yeah, communities. Yeah. We will invite you if we have an open house. Or <laughs> a Zoom Hopefully. meeting in one until COVID's over. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, the issue is that we are so big in food and when we have these events, we have tables and tables of food and people enjoy it. And uh, these ladies that I always uh, encourage to, uh, you know, to flourish their talents, uh, they bring a lot of food and they're always there. They love when people eat their food. And, uh, yeah, and they can't really do that now. Yeah, it's really hard. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> Of course, my pleasure. I'm happy. Thank you for inviting me for this uh, episode. And um, I really look forward for other uh, feedback and also if we yeah. want to do it. Yeah. Remember